Grab whoever's logged on so we have a record of it. All right, we're going to go get started. Today we're going to talk about hand, hand tool and power tool safety as well as hand safety because they kind of go together. Is that everyone? All right, we're going to start with the hand and power tool safety. We actually have three videos. Two of them are relatively short. As we look back on injury experiences, one frightening thought comes clearly in focus. Hand and power tools cause thousands of injuries every year. Everyone uses hand and power tools, at work and at home. But even the simple screwdriver causes over a hundred deaths each year. It's difficult to get excited about hand and power tools, but the injury rate tells us safety is extremely important when using this equipment. This program can't possibly cover all hand and power tools and all the safety rules associated with using these items, but the point we want to stress right up front is safety must be exercised every time anyone uses hand and power tools. Safety awareness is of vital importance. So let's begin the program with some basics. A good safety attitude is the first step in injury prevention. If you're aware of the potential hazards, then do something about these hazards to protect yourself and others. Then you have a good safety attitude. Safety behavior is a term used quite frequently, but all it means is a person exercises good judgment, follows safety rules, and doesn't take shortcuts to get the job done. Safety behavior reflects your safety attitude, and it certainly doesn't take any more time, effort, or anything else on your part to be a truly safe employee. It does require you to use good judgment and follow the safety rules established by your organization. Okay, the first rule for hand and power tool safety is to use equipment that is in good, safe, serviceable condition. Regardless of who provides the tools and equipment, either you or your employer, all tools and equipment must be in good, serviceable condition. Defective equipment must be taken out of service and not used until it is repaired or replaced. Okay, let's take a few seconds to talk about knuckle skinners, also known as wrenches. Most wrench accidents are caused by the wrench slipping off the bolt or nut you're trying to turn. Knuckles and fingers bang into surfaces, causing minor injuries. When you're turning something with a wrench, be prepared for the wrench to slip so the injury can be prevented. If you're prepared, you'll prevent the injury. When using long-handled wrenches, position your feet and body in such a manner so that if the wrench slips, you won't take a fall. Another safety tip is to make sure the wrench opening fits snugly on the nut or bolt. A loose fit damages the tool and it certainly increases the injury potential. Never try to use metric wrenches on inch fasteners or vice versa. Use the proper tool for the job. One of the worst safety violations is to use a cheater bar. A cheater bar is something like a pipe placed on the wrench or tool to give you more leverage. Your wrench or tool is designed only for hand pressure, and when you add a cheater bar, you're exceeding the safety design of the tool. Just say no to cheater bars. Certainly, there are times when you need to loosen a frozen nut or bolt and hand pressure won't do it. That's when you need to use a heavy-duty striking tool and some penetrating oil. The striking tool is designed to be hit with a hammer and will do the job so you don't have to use a cheater bar or other hazardous operation to free that frozen bolt or nut. There are basically three types of socket wrenches and sockets. Hand sockets, power sockets, and impact sockets. 
Never mix the different types. In other words, don't use a hand socket on an impact wrench. Each type is designed for a specific wrench, and when you use the wrong socket, you can easily damage the wrench or socket. If you're using an impact wrench, use only impact sockets designed for the job. Adjustable wrenches are very versatile, and they're used for a variety of jobs. One of the major causes of injuries with adjustable wrenches is using damaged wrenches. When the adjustable threads become worn, or the surface on the inside of the jaw becomes rounded from use, the tool is unsafe to use. Replace this damaged tool with one in serviceable condition. It may seem like a simple solution, and it is, but adjustable wrenches that are worn out should be replaced. The same basic rule applies to bench vices. When the jaws of the vise become worn, it's time to replace the jaws. You don't have to replace the whole vise, just the worn jaws. Another tip for bench vices is to make sure they are securely fastened to the work table or bench. Power tools and equipment require special attention because when an injury does occur, it's usually very serious. Not much room for error on powered equipment. Before you use any power tool, inspect it to make sure it's in good condition and has no defects or safety hazards. If your power equipment uses cutting blades, bits, or other such attachments, make sure they are sharp and in good condition. Dull blades and bits can cause damage to the material you're cutting and can also contribute to personal injury. Be sure all your equipment is in proper working order. Electrical tools have at least one safety device to protect the user from electrical shock. This safety device is called grounding and, in some cases, double insulation. Let's review grounding because this is the most common protection on electrical tools and appliances. Grounding means there is a third wire in the tool running through the third prong in the plug. <coughs> there is a grounding wire or connection from the electrical power source or receptacle that goes to earth or ground. In the event of an electrical short or other malfunction of the tool, electricity will flow through this ground to earth and not through your body. If the ground prong is broken off or the ground wire is broken or there is a gap in the electrical ground, the electricity will have nowhere to go except through the person holding the tool. This tells you that it's very important to inspect your electrical equipment for defects before you use the equipment. Some tools afford you shock protection by double insulating the inside of the tool. In the event of a short or other malfunction, the operator is protected by this double insulation. You may notice some electrical tools that only have two prongs on the electrical plug. The first thing you should do is check the manufacturer's data plate for the words double insulated. If you see an electrical tool with only two prongs and the tool does not state it is double insulated, then do not use this particular tool until it's replaced or repaired for the proper ground. Regardless of the type of shock protection on your electrical tool, it won't help if you're using the equipment near water, liquids, or other unsafe conditions. Sweaty palms or perspiration when using electrical tools is also unsafe as a wet or moist environment is extremely hazardous around electricity. Another good tip is never carry any equipment by the electrical cord. Yanking cords out of the wall receptacle by the cord is also unsafe. Remove the plug from the wall receptacle by holding the plug, not the cord. When using any type of electrical equipment, always inspect the plugs, cords, cables, and attaching hardware for frays, cracks, cuts, or damage. Electricity is nothing to fool with, so don't take chances with your equipment. If it's not safe to use, don't use it. You've all seen or probably used octopus receptacles and plugs to increase the electrical outlets. When you do this, you're exceeding the design of the wall receptacle, and if you use too much current or amps, you can trip circuit breakers and, even worse, overload the circuit and quite possibly cause a fire. Don't use octopus plugs. 
Another safety factor around electricity is using three-prong adapters, such as the one shown here. It has three prongs for you to insert your grounded plug, but it only has two prongs for the receptacle. The idea is to use this grounding wire and connect it to the wall receptacle, which is supposedly designed to ground the system. These types of plugs are unsafe and that? should never be used in any industrial environment. In fact, they should never be used in a home either. Okay, let's quickly review some more basic safety tips. The first tip is relating to power drills. All drill bits must be sharp in order to drill safely. Dull bits can damage the material or can break and cause a serious injury. Be sure drill bits are sharp and in good condition. When you're drilling, don't use excessive force. If you need a larger drill or some other type of equipment to do the job, that's okay. But don't try to bully a drill bit into material by using excessive force. When you're tightening a drill bit into the chuck, be sure it's properly tightened and never tighten the drill bit with anything other than the proper chuck. If you use screwdrivers or other makeshift chucks, you're asking for trouble. When using portable hand saws, always make sure the guard is in place and working properly. Never remove the guard or tie it back. Mechanical guards are designed for your protection, and it's really unsafe to render any guard inoperable. There is always a safe way to use your equipment. Taking chances, such as using your leg as a workbench, is an accident waiting to happen. It doesn't make sense. Everyone wants to complete their job as quickly as possible, but think about the time off from work that results from an injury. The 10 seconds you save becomes 10 or more hours of lost time. When you're working with hand and power tools, your safety attitude and common sense are the two most important parts of your job. Your organization can have the most effective safety rules and the best equipment, but if you neglect the attitude part, you're heading for trouble. Recognize the potential hazards of the job, such as sharp edges, falling objects, extreme heat or cold, chemicals, flammables, and electricity. Think through each task before you do it and know what you're asking of your hands and body. Follow the safety rules, even if you've gotten away with shortcuts before. In the event of an injury, even a minor injury, report it to your supervisor when it occurs, so medical attention can be provided if it's needed. Use personal protective equipment when it's provided and necessary, and think about safety on every job you perform. Hand and power tools are very safe to use if you follow the rules. <coughs> follow your organization's safety policies and procedures and you'll find that your job is easier, quicker, and you'll be a safer employee. It's that simple. Thank you. It seems like common sense, wearing gloves to protect your hands. Almost always this is true, but when working around machinery with moving parts, wearing gloves can actually create a danger. That's what happened to Julie. Despite having no experience, Julie offered to help mill parts at a friend's business. The business owner warned Julie about the danger of clothes, hair, and jewelry getting caught in the milling machine but not about the same risk with gloves. Spinning at high speed, the chuck caught the glove Julie was wearing, breaking and cutting her arm. Luckily, the glove ripped apart, allowing her to free herself. Wearing gloves around rotating or moving parts can pose a serious entanglement hazard. In the last five years, about 300 manufacturing workers in BC submitted injury claims as a result of getting a glove caught in machinery. Let's test your knowledge of when and when not to wear gloves. Should this worker using an angle grinder be wearing gloves? Yes or no? Yes, but he needs to keep both hands on the handles of the grinder. This worker is using a lathe to turn down a piece of stock. Gloves? Yes or no? No, lathes are notorious for catching onto gloves. 
You're running a drill press. Gloves? Yes or no? No. Gloves can be caught in the rotating bit or chuck. Watch out for Swarth too. It's like a magnet for snagging gloves or loose clothing. Grinding metal on a bench grinder. Gloves? Yes or no? No. Gloves, even tight fitting ones, should not be worn on operating bench or pedestal grinders. You need to move this wood strip away from this drive chain. Gloves? Yes or no? This is a trick question. A BC worker actually reached in and knocked the wood strip down with his hand. A chain sprocket caught his glove, pulling his hand into the sprocket and amputating it. The important thing here, when clearing debris or doing maintenance, is to de-energize and lock out the system first. Guard the nick points as well. Each workplace is unique. Assess yours to determine when it's the right time to wear gloves and also when it's not. Afternoon. I think it was about 4.30, uh, the day it finished. The boss said the truck that I usually use had broken down again. A couple of days earlier the, the alternator bracket had broken and we got it welded fixed. We both walked over and I sort of put my head underneath the, the hood of the truck and stuff like that and as I grabbed the, the belt to see if the bracket was still attached he um, didn't realise that I was there and turned the key over and caught my finger between the pulley and the belt. We didn't realise straight away that anything happened. I sort of pulled my hand back and said, you squashed my finger. And then, um, yeah, then I looked down and realised that um, sort of half of it was gone. And within a split second, so many times, we lifted the hood up and checked it and it seemed to be just one of those things, Friday afternoon. But when it first happened, I lost to that part there. Um, the bone and all that was still there but all the skin and tissue and that was gone. It had all been ripped off. I was taken to hospital um, and had surgery that night where they removed the first, or the end of your finger, the first knuckle. Um, and I think I was in a cast for nine weeks, um, which then once we took that off, we found that there was another problem with the um, part of the bone that was still in there was broken and sharp. Um, so they had to go in and operate again take that part out and then over yeah, the the, the, the nine year period I had four operations on my hand to cut the hand open to see what they could do um, they split the actual finger open three times all the way down and peeled it back to see if there was any tendon damage stuff like that which they couldn't find um, and then after I think four cortisone injections and the, the six operations or the final operation they took the, <coughs> the finger off the end right down at the base and that's what's left with now. It was three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. And we had one lift to go before we were finished for the day. I couldn't quite reach the shackle I had to undo to finish the day off. And we were worried about the traffic, getting out of Sydney at the end of the day. So I thought I'd just climb up the foot and grab it. There was a bit of water up there. I slipped, fell off, only fell on a foot foot and a half, but I hit my hand on a bit of timber before I hit the ground. Um, the ramifications of that were I dislocated every single bone in my hand, I shattered my thumb, I destroyed my wrist, and I snapped every single tendon from my wrist to my elbow. I've lost count of how many, how many operations I had, it was a matter of for six years, every time I was strong enough, back in, more, more surgery, get strong enough, back in, more surgery. I was very lucky I had the best hand surgeon in the country, but still it took six years of operations before I was able to start strengthening my hand again. So I've now got two steel pins that go through my wrist that way, and a big steel plate that goes down my thumb and then wraps around my wrist with six screws in it. This bone here is made out of my hip. I had to go in through my leg and take bone out of my hip to rebuild that bone. And then my thumb actually just hangs off the end on the skin. It doesn't actually do anything. 
I think we're looking at it's now about 10, 14 years since I finished the operations and I'm still trying to get it up to strength. That one split second we were worried about the time and about getting away and beating the traffic. I didn't want to go and get a ladder or something because it was going to burn us a couple more minutes. I thought I'll just go up and I'll jump up and I'll undo that and we'll be gone. It was just, for two minutes, it cost me six years, at least six years, for two minutes time. All I had to do was just get a step or get a ladder and yeah, every time you watch your mates run out and play football or you went and saw your mates play in a band, it came back to you every time. I was just uh, trimming up some, some timber on a table saw. Come down to the last um, little piece and I uh, fed that into the, to the table saw with a push stick. Just started feeding it through like I normally do and, and uh, my, my grip must have loosened up just slightly and, uh, and caught a couple of fingers, dragged them through and then spat it out and, uh, and two fingers. Um, gone. Um, yeah, just the, the main two. Um, yeah, just uh, just on right on the knuckle there. That was just one of those things. Yeah, sort of, um, you know, not concentrating in the morning and, and bang, and off they come. Yeah, it's just affected me. Just the day to day things, um, like doing buttons up, wide grip tools. Definitely, I struggle with them with that hand. So maybe I might have to adjust with the other hand. Um, which sometimes isn't as strong, you know, or I'll have to use two hands instead of just using that right hand, which was the dominant hand before. Um, so I've had to adjust, and now my left is definitely um, compensated for my right, so I use my left uh, a lot more. It's definitely changed things, yeah, for sure. It just makes me makes me more aware of what could happen. Um, if you just stop thinking for, for you know, a split second. So I sort of just uh, only have to think about that situation and it, and it sort of resets me back into sort of, um, you know, safety mode. So I'm a pipe fitter, so what I'm doing um, in the cut of pipe, where the blade is going along and to um, get the, the, the swap in the building up. So I'm, I should have stopped the machine and clear up the swap. But um, I just, same time, and the blade is working on and the, and the take a swap off. But um, the swap is to uh, take my gloves and uh, my finger, so my finger to the bone in the hit by stopper. Oh, I can remember to really, really to less than a second to hit the stopper. I should turn the machine off and clean the swap off. The stopper hit the, is on my bone here and it's all squashed the bone or squash in the break the bone and squash the finger is a hit just here in the center so this bone inside here it is broken and the finger was squashed i i, I could i couldn't get pain because i was shocked <laughs> there was a ruby joe so i went to the dolby hospital uh, dolby hospital is uh, not enough to the operation and all that they organized with um, St. Vincent Hospital in Toowoomba. So straight through to operation in the same day in the afternoon. Still pin inside and uh, three rings in holding on holding on to the broken bones. It's not gonna straight anymore. Just ignore the rules. I did it. Shouldn't take any shortcut to the proper way to do. A work colleague hit my finger with a hammer, four pound hammer. Flat out, yes, uh, didn't hold back. It wasn't actually his fault, it was no positive communication, I'd imagine. The nanosecond after it happened, I didn't feel any pain. I remember that, I remember immediately pulling my hand back and stepping back two paces, and it didn't register, the pain didn't register. And I knew that there was something wrong, and I had my gloves on. And when I pulled the glove off, then the blood started to come out and then I think that's when the pain kicked in. What should you have done differently or what should both of you have done differently? Probably spoken about the job in length before we actually started it. Although it seemed like a very straightforward thing that I'd done a, a lot of a lot of in my um, construction career. 
it seemed like a very simple thing to do. I think you need to be, it's positive communication with your work colleague and you've got to get to know them. It's just that one split second where you change something and you could have thought, well, maybe if we did it a different way or sometimes you think to yourself, oh, well, I've hurt myself, I'll be, I'll be right in a week or uh, two weeks or whatever. Um, but like I said, mine took nine years. I had six operations um, and that was just on a finger. I was playing in bands at the time. I was playing first grade football. I used to play indoor cricket. If all these things disappeared overnight, I couldn't play them again. We put a halt on a fair bit. Um, I used to go to the gym a bit um, and motorbike riding and stuff like that, which sort of come to a halt completely. In an instant. So it's imagine, that's, you can't imagine how your life changes in an instant. And that's, that's just the way it happens. When I'm thinking like a bad dream, okay, but is a, how can it happen? I keep thinking, but I can't remember how it happened. With my job, we were doing probably 14 hours a day, six days a week. Um, so the impact on the on the money side of it was pretty big. I believe my son was about four year old at the time. Couldn't pick him up. They couldn't couldn't rough around, mess around with him. We had to be careful all the time. It really really stopped me from doing a lot of things that I used to do. Think of the impact later on down the track. Um, you know, I lost my left ring finger. I can't wear a wedding ring. Just keep, keep your mind on the job and just sort of keep focused on on uh, even just the smallest tasks because um, they can have sort of serious consequences, you know. Just message is just follow the rules, don't take a shortcut. The big thing is communication. You've got to, you've got to be able to talk to each other um, and, and make sure that he knows what you're doing and you know what, what they're doing and actually plan what you're doing. If it takes five minutes to do it safe, five minutes is nothing. Five minutes is nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Really think you'd want to communicate well if somebody's going to be swinging a four pound hammer near your fingers. That one is probably the most surprising, but really, you get hurt at work, it isn't just impacting you at work. It's going to impact your whole life and at home. That's really the important stuff. Again, with the power tools and the hand tools, you've got to make sure they're in good working order. They showed them looking at that hammer. You can inspect the hammer in about a third of the time they did on the video. They're doing it. It doesn't take long to check the tools. I don't know if you can find many tools that are two prong plugs anymore. I know way back when I actually had a metal not double insulated, two pronged by dad gave, I think it was from the 50s. This drill could drill anything. And, but it wasn't used very often, but I kind of even figured it out. And it, looked, it was older than me. And replaced that with a cordless down the road. Uh, if you've got damaged personal tools, you need to replace them. If it's damaged tools that are ours, say something. We've replaced them. We will replace them or we'll get them repaired. You know, we don't want you using tools that are going to cause an injury. Talking about when not to use gloves, keep in mind, you're supposed to be wearing gloves the rest of the time. Uh, the one guy smashed the hand. No jewelry when you're working. The reason is jewelry can get caught in equipment, okay? I've had an employee with a degloving injury, and I've had people go, what's degloving? It's kind of like what you do to a chicken wing. You know, you're taking all the meat off of the bone. He had his wedding ring on, he was stepping down off of a truck from bumper level. He put a ladder up and his, his ring got caught in the, on the hook for the ladder. There were some other complications. They didn't tell us what type of injury it was when it occurred. It was just a finger injury. It was a $100,000 claim. The finger, he resisted them cutting it off when it first happened. And the reality is, when the claim was settled, he goes, I wish I would have just had him cut it off. Because he's got, his ring finger is about twice the size of his other fingers, and it's useless. It's just there. And uh, even his wife admitted she was the kind would have been griping at him for taking his ring off at work. And now she wishes, you know, now she says, I would give anything for him to be able to wear his wedding ring. So, something to keep in mind. Uh, we've had some challenges with some customers because of our mod related to the claims we had a few years ago. The thing that's saving us right now 
is you guys are making great decisions. You're working safe. We need you to keep that up. Hopefully we will get through both this <coughs> work comp policy year and this calendar year with very few injuries that will help us. And then we will start. Our mod is going to go up one more time in October and then it will start coming down. What we need to do is keep having good years so we can bring it down uh, as fast as possible and get it to where clients and potential clients aren't looking at us and just looking at that one number and looking that we're unsafe. You know, we've had a really good trend from double digit injuries. You know, we've had one injury in the last 16 months. Before that, we only had, I think, two the year before that. So we're, you guys are doing a great job. Keep it up. Any questions, safety issues on either the power hand tools or any other questions? All right, guys, have a safe week. Appreciate it. I've got <coughs> one thing uh, on the small sandblasters. I know most of you know how to use them, use them but uh, be sure to 